Well, if I haven't met you before, I'm Rebecca. Is that loud? It feels loud here. And um, I haven't preached for a while. Has anyone noticed? Oh, that's nice, maybe. Is that like, not yes, like, yeah, it's been like too long, or is it, yeah, like you can leave now? But um, I feel a bit nervous suddenly. I felt a little bit nervous last night and then a little bit this morning, but I was actually so nervous that I'm sitting there and halfway through, I hadn't even realized, halfway through the service, Will sends Phil a text and Phil shows me, and it's like Rebecca hasn't got a headset on, like I wasn't at all prepared to preach. I forgot that that's what you do before church when you're about to preach. But um, it's been a long time. And um, that's for all sorts of reasons, but the main reason is we've had lots of really great special Sundays, haven't we, with the kids and with the youth, and I've had some holidays, and just before I went on holidays, I preached five times in one weekend at a women's event in Perth, five times. So this morning should be easy, right? But you all look a little bit scary, so... (laughs) So maybe you can like smile nicely and nod and and like take out your devices just to write notes rather than look at Facebook and Instagram. (laughs) We can tell, you know, just a little secret. You can tell when someone's taking notes and when someone's like scanning their Instagram and stuff. Anyway, (laughs) not to make you feel bad. You're like, yeah, sit down now. That's enough. All right. Well, wasn't last week a great a great service and I think it was great because it was real and I left feeling like there were so many questions that were raised in the book of Habakkuk and no answers but in a way that made me feel okay because actually that's how life is and so the book of Habakkuk that we've been looking at and we've just agreed that we're going to say it however we like if you weren't here last week because basically it's said all different ways so however I say it it's going to be fine but um, Habakkuk that book is one of the 12 minor prophets. So the, most of those are towards the end of the Old Testament. And this book was written about 600 BC, 600 years before Christ. And God, t- God told the prophet Habakkuk, what I want you to do is to tell your people I'm going to destroy them because they're wicked. And chances are Habakkuk would have said, yeah, I've been crying out to you, God, saying these people are wicked. What are you going to do about it? So that probably wouldn't have been a big surprise. He would have like, been like, yeah, I think about time you told them, God, that you're going to destroy them. But God adds a little twist, and he says, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians, and they're going to destroy my people. And Habakkuk would have thought, hang on, wait a minute, God. You're saying you're going to raise up these evil people, these really bad, bad, bad evil people to destroy a lesser evil people. Really, God, is that what you're saying? That's ridiculous. And actually, the book of um, Habakkuk is written, especially the first two chapters, with a bit of judicial language. It's like Habakkuk is taking God to court, saying, this is not fair. He's saying, I've got evidence to prove that your actions, God, are not just. No just God would do this. What you're doing doesn't seem fair. I object. And so today, if you're facing something and you're thinking, I just don't understand God, God where are you in this? God, I can think I can see what you're doing, but it doesn't even seem right. Then I'm certain the book of Habakkuk will speak to you. And as we saw last week, it won't necessarily give us answers and might not give us the answers that we want, but I'm sure that it will speak to you. I'm sure that God will use it to, to come close to you in this time. Last week, we learned that the book of Habakkuk, or the name Habakkuk, means to embrace or to wrestle. We had that image of a wrestler who reminded us that Habakkuk is really a great example, a great illustration of the fact that it's really possible for a committed believer, someone that's really in love with Jesus, to simultaneously have both questions and faith. And that it's okay to wrestle with those. It's okay to question when facing crisis. It's okay to to wrestle with God and to struggle in difficult times. And if you missed last week's message, I encourage you to get online and to catch up because we're going to quickly move on today to chapter 2. So today we're going to let the book of Habakkuk speak to us about some things that we can do. I'm a pretty of a practical person and often if you come to me with a problem and you describe the problem, I'll say, well, what can we do about it? Because I, I don't like getting caught up in all the problems and issues and, and the concerns of the world with like, well, what can I do? Well, what's my part in this? And so I'm often like that with my relationship with God. Well, God, I don't understand, but what can I do? And Habakkuk 2 is really what that... What, That's what that's about, especially the first few verses, and that's where we're going to get our points, if you like, this morning, from the first three verses of Habakkuk chapter 2. So when we're questioning God, when we're thinking, God, this isn't fair, we've put out our concerns to God, and we're waiting to see what God's going to do, what things can we do? Firstly, this morning, 
I'm sure the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 1, tells us that we need to stop and listen. We need to stop and listen. Habakkuk basically in chapter 1 has said, God, I don't like this. I'm complaining to you. He's blabbed on and on about how unfair God is. He's heard a little bit from God, but he's put out a second round of, of complaints, of concerns. And God's good. God's like, sure, like, I've, I'm happy for you to wrestle with me, Habakkuk. And he comes back. And in this time at the beginning of chapter 2, Habakkuk's waiting for a second response. And see what he does in verse 1. It says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. In other words, I'm going to look out for what God's doing. I'm going to intentionally position myself somewhere where I'm going to see what God's doing, where I'm going to see it's coming. I'm going to choose hope. I'm going to choose to believe God's going to act, but I'm going to put myself somewhere where I can see it. The second part of that verse says, I will look to see not just what God's going to do, but also what God will say to me. I'm going to position myself on the watchtower, the best place to see what's happening, and I'm going to listen to what God will say to me. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to listen. You know, too often I think what we do, maybe I'm just talking about myself this morning, what I do is I just whine and whine about what God's doing or not doing and about my situation. And sometimes even when I pray, I'll, I'll just tell God all the problems and, and, and what I think he should do. But how often do we actually stop and put ourselves in a position to intentionally hear what God might say to us. To intentionally look to what God is trying to show us in what we're facing. How will he speak? You know, God is a relational God. God is a God that wants to speak to us. He wants to communicate to us. He wants to answer our complaints as he did for Habakkuk. How will he speak? Well, in all different ways. Some of you, you would have heard audibly from God. You would have said, I've heard God's voice. And that hasn't happened to me quite in formed, audible words. But every day when I open his word and read his word, he speaks. Often he speaks through another person. He speaks through a situation. He speaks when I'm in the silence and a thought comes into my head and I've asked God, tell me where to go. He speaks. Every single day he can speak to you. And he speaks to me when I stop and listen. And here's the deal. When we speak or when we listen and God speaks, sometimes we're not going to like what he says. Sometimes we're not going to like the answer. Habakkuk's not going to like the answer that God comes back with. This wasn't what he was looking for. But at least when God speaks, we're in relationship with him. We know he's with us. We can see a little bit more of what he's up to. You know, the New Test in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he had what he called a thorn in his flesh or a thorn in his side. And we don't know what that was. It was some sort of issue for him. It could have been some physical ailments, something literally physical. It could have been the fact that he struggled with some mental illness, some depression. It could have been the fact that there were just people that were always speaking against him and he always felt like he was in a battle like we don't know exactly what that thorn of the flesh is, but we do know that he prayed over and over and over again for God to take it away. Paul says, three times I begged. Three times he said, God, I'm pleading with you, take this away. God, I'm pleading with you, take this away. God, take this away. And God basically said, I could, but I've decided not to. My answer to you is no. No. Why? God says, Paul, I'm going to do something even better than take it away. And you might not understand, but I'm going to teach you that my grace is all you need. You see, I could do what you want, Paul, but I'm not going to because I'm going to do something different inside you, something that I think is eternally much more valuable. When we don't understand, we need to stop, we need to listen, accept what God says, even if it's not the answer we want. And the second thing we can do when God seems unfair, when we're waiting for a response from him, is we can write. We can write. We write what God shows us. Habakkuk says, where are you? What's going on, God? And God says, you want to know? I'm about to tell you, Habakkuk, but make sure you take notes. That's not exactly what God said. I'll read it from the Bible. Verse 2. Habakkuk, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. 
In other words, God wanted Habakkuk to write it down so that one day Habakkuk and generations could look back and say, this is what God said was going to happen. God is a God of his word. What he says is true. Now, it's also for Habakkuk's and for our benefit too to write things down. I have a habit of forgetting things. Anyone a bit like that? They for- we forget sometimes. We, we think that we're not going to forget something when we hear it or when we say it, but we forget. So regularly, I'll say to Phil, can you pick up some stuff from the shops for me on the way home? Like, I'll be talking to him, and I'll say, we just need some milk and some rice. And he'll go, just, just send me a text. And I'll go, no, 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 that's the list. He'll go, I want the list. That's the list. Oh, and maybe some bread. But anyway, I'll send him the list because he says something happens, I just forget on the way there. I forget. So I'll send him the list. And the list is helpful. When he gets there, what does he do? Well, hopefully, he looks it up. Are you right, Phil? <laughs> hopefully, he looks it up in the shop. But you know, the other thing that the list is helpful for me for, when he gets home and I'll say, where's the rice? And he says, you didn't tell me to get that. I can also show him where I've written it down. So it actually provides two benefits. He supposedly doesn't forget what I tell him and I can show him when he's forgotten anyway. But we, we have this tendency to forget, don't we? I know it's like that in my time with God. Sometimes I'll be crying out to God and, and asking God something about a situation And he'll tell me something, or I feel like I get some answers about something. And then sometimes as I go throughout my day, I'll start to wonder, did God really say that to me this morning, or was I just thinking about that? And then as days and weeks go on, I I more and more doubt, oh, actually, I think that was, I misunderstood, that that wasn't really a thing. God, God says to Habakkuk, write it down so that you remember, so that people, the herald who goes and tells the world, will remember and will really know. We can't rely on our memory. What do you do when you hit a crisis? We stop. We listen. And when God says anything, or when we think God says anything, through someone, through a song, through a message, through, through an encounter directly with him, we write it down. Keep it somewhere where we can look back in. I'm not overly good at journaling really, really regularly, but every day I write some things down as a result of what I read and what I write, or what I read and what I pray about to God. And I write something down, and it's very powerful looking back. Rather than becoming something that I forget or that I wonder whether God said it or not, it becomes a bit of an anchor. Oh, yeah, actually, in that time, God said this, and it was true. So I'm sure it's true for my today as well. Stop and listen, and when God speaks, write it down. And thirdly, this morning, the thing that we most like to do, we need to wait. In our waiting for God, what do we do? We need to wait. We wait. It's a bit awkward, isn't it? doesn't feel quite right sometimes to wait. You're all getting a little bit giggly and fidgety. We don't like to wait. But watch what God says to the prophet in verse 3. He says, For the revelation, for the answer, if you like, for the time where we'll understand, for the time where we'll see what God's doing, for the revelation, it awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end and it will not prove false. Though it linger... Though it linger, wait for it, and it will certainly come and will not delay. When God promises something, we often have to wait a while for it. Some of you are waiting right now. Some of you have been waiting for a long time. Some of you know that God's shown you something. Maybe you've even written something down, written a promise down that God's given you, but you're starting to wonder if it's ever going to happen. But I want to remind you this morning that when God promises something, it's a sure thing. When we look through Scripture, there's example after example. We saw some of them in the video earlier of people that would look to God and God would promise them something. And then they'd have to wait a really long time for it to come to pass, for it to eventuate, for it to actually happen. Think about Moses. Moses is told, I'm going to use you to deliver God's people and rebuild the nation. And he ends up wandering around for 40 years, 40 years. Joseph, God says to him, you're going to be a great leader. And what happens in the meantime? 
His brothers beat him, throw him into a well, they sell him into slavery, he, he spends years in prison, and it's lots and lots and lots of years before God fulfills the promise and eventually elevates him to the second highest command in all of Egypt. There was a lot of waiting in between the promise and seeing it come about. The Apostle Paul, we spoke about him earlier, he has a vision, he meets Christ, his life is transformed, and he says, I'm called to preach the gospel, I'm compelled to preach, that's what I'm here to do, he believed that with his whole heart. And you know, from that time on, it was 13 years before he ever said, okay, please open your Bibles and we're going to speak today about my letter to the first Corinthians, you know, like 13 years he waited before he preached, when he was told that he was life design was to preach the gospel. So if you're here this morning, you're thinking, okay, I'm waiting. I'm stuck right here. Looks like there's nothing I can do to pass the time. It's not quite true, is it? Remember the book of Habakkuk, the name Habakkuk means to embrace, to wrestle, to struggle. There's actually things that we can do. It's an active waiting. Wrestlers don't just stand there and say, come at me. They actually, they don't move very much, but there's actually such intensity, such, such active waiting, if you like, in that time. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to think about how you're waiting. Is your waiting an active process? Because, you know, when we wait on God, we don't wait like we sit and wait in a doctor's room. You know how frustrating that is. I shared a little bit in the Messenger and, and Facebook this week about my waiting experience in a hospital and, and how you just did things to pass the time and you felt really helpless. But actually, when we're waiting on God, there's things that we can do. When we wait on God, we don't wait in a hospital like we wait in a hospital. We wait like we're a waiter in a restaurant. That's a real different image, isn't it? A waiter in a restaurant, what do they do? They, they seek to please their customers, especially in places like America when their livelihood depends on tips. But they come and they say, can I get you something else? Would you like a refill? How can I help you? They, they try to get to know their customers, anticipate their needs, be responsive as possible. Waiters don't sit in the corner waiting for a customer to ring a bell for the waiter to come. The best waiters are there serving, seeking to please. Waiting doesn't mean that we do nothing. We need to be waiting on God, seeking to please him, hearing what he wants from us, being willing to be obedient in the small things as well as the big things. Even when we don't understand, we continue to serve him and we wait on him for the appointed time, as this passage says. And the word for the appointed time is the, is the word moed. Moed. And it's a fixed or appointed time. It's a time that can't be changed. It's a time that means when it comes, it comes. We can't bring it forward quicker. We can't do anything to make it come later. If you've ever been pregnant, you know about this, right? When you have a baby and you're about to give birth, when it's time, it's time, right? So I'm not going to tell you anything about my birth this morning because I've really tried to put that right in the back of my mind and never thinking about it again. But about... um. Nine years ago, I had a friend, her name was also Rebecca, and um, she was a young girl, she was about 21 years old, she'd already had another kid, she had a toddler, and she had a partner, um, and he'd had his license expelled, what's the word, like taken off him for 20 years, 20 years. I met Rebecca, she was, um, her husband or her partner was at Miracle Haven in recovery and he was doing great, but he'd done a whole lot of really stupid things from the time he was 14 to 20 and you can imagine how stupid to get your license expelled for 20 years. Anyway, she was pregnant and um, I remember the conversation, it was September, she was due in January and I was her bridesmaid at her and we were sitting around at the end of the day and I just said to her, how, how are you going to get to the hospital? The hospital was about a half an hour drive away. Like when the time comes, when the appointed time comes, how are you going to get to the hospital? And she's like, oh, I'll probably just drive myself. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's such a good idea. So I said to her as a good friend, if you need me to drive you to the hospital, you know that I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to drive you to the hospital. We never spoke any more of it. And on the 2nd of January, about 2 o'clock in the morning, you know where this is going, I get a phone call. And she's like, oh, hi, it's Rebecca here. And I'm like, 
hi, <laughs> as you do. And she's like, um, you know, a few months ago you offered to drive me to the hospital. Well, I'm actually in a bit of pain and it would be really great if you could drive me to the hospital. I'm like, oh, oh, like the baby's coming. And she's like, oh, yeah, it's no hurry, but if you could come soon, that would be good. She only lived a couple of streets away. I was probably there in about 10 minutes flat. And by the time I got there and I walked in the door, Rebecca was on the lounge room floor screaming, like screaming like I wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe, like screaming, screaming. Anyway, so I'm like, oh, okay, um, let's just get in the car then. And she's just yelling at me and there was probably lots of like four-letter words in, in that yelling. And basically she was telling me nicely um, that she wasn't going to get in my car, that the baby was coming. And I'm like, nah, nah, like just come in the car because you can't have the baby here. She's like, no, nah, not going anywhere, the baby is coming. Anyway, I call an ambulance because I wasn't delivering no baby. And um, I, <laughs> I called the ambulance and the ambulance is asking me to do things and see things that I never want to think about again. And sure enough, that baby was coming. There was nothing that I could do to slow it down. No, no um, amount of, Rebecca, it's okay, just come and get in the car, was going to stop that baby coming. Like, it was time. And the baby came and I almost dropped the baby as she ran to the bathroom and... And the father, I didn't know, was at home asleep in bed. Yes, he had no license, but he could have been there delivering the baby. <laughs> yep. Good times. <laughs> she was like, I'm not getting in the car. The baby's coming. It's time. When it's time, it's time. There was nothing that I could do. And you know, it's like that with God. When we're waiting on God, sometimes I think we do things to try to speed him up. Or sometimes we're not ready for what God wants and we try to put things off to slow things down. But this word, this moed, means actually at the fixed time, it's going to happen. There's nothing that human efforts can do to thwart God's plans. Nothing. You know, God had promised Habakkuk that the Babylonians would be, Babylonians would be destroyed. He said, it's going to happen. But his people had to wait a long time. In fact, it actually happened in the next generation. God's promise was fulfilled. He didn't see the promise fulfilled then and there. But God's word is absolutely true. God says, Habakkuk, do this. Listen, I'm going to speak to you. Take notes and then wait. I understand God was saying that Babylonians are bad. And he goes on, and I want you to, in your own time this week, read from verses about 6 to 19, I think it is, about all the things that God said were going to happen to the Babylonians. He said the Babylonians, they're puffed up. They think it's all about them. They think that they don't need to follow God's rules. They think they've got it sorted and figured out. They think that God's stuff doesn't apply to them. But then God says, their time will come. I know what they're doing. I'm going to punish them. In my time, wait for it, you will see that I am a just God. You don't understand right now, you think I'm unfair, but you will see that I am a just God. My word is good. Have a look at, at Habakkuk 2, 4. God says about the Babylonians, his desires are not upright, but the righteous, this is the second part of verse 4, but the righteous will live by faith. The righteous, those who are mine, us here today, those who are trying to do what God wants us to do, trying to be obedient to God and the big things and little things, the, the righteous, they will live by faith, not by what's going on around them, not by their questions. You, we, we can question, that's fine, but that's not what we live by. The righteous, no matter what's happening, will live by faith, what they know about God, what they've heard in the past about God, what they've seen God do, what they've written down about what God's promised them. Look at the, the message paraphrase of this verse, talking about the Babylonians at first. Look at that man, bloated by self-importance, full of himself but soul empty, but the person in right standing before God through loyal and steady believing is fully alive, really alive. That's what life to the full is about. It's about steady believing, really being alive because of what we believe, not because of what's going on around us, not because we don't have what God has promised us or what we think we deserve just yet. 
You know, Habakkuk 2 ends slightly more promising than Habakkuk 1, which really left us hanging last week. But we don't really get a great resolve ever. It's a little bit better in Habakkuk 3, but there's not a lot of resolve, and life is so much like that. There's no, for a lot of life, and certainly for Habakkuk, there's no, and they all lived happily ever after, ending. But we can find some solace, some peace, I think, today, some, some context or perspective, if you like, in verse 20. Verse 20, Habakkuk says, even though I don't understand and I don't like it, even though I don't really want to believe what's going on, he says this, but the Lord is in his holy temple. But the Lord is in his holy temple. In other words, the Lord is still in charge. The Lord is still good. The Lord is righteous. The Lord has a plan. The Lord is still there. So I will live by faith. wonder how many of you this morning need to, to say that to God. God, I know you're still on your throne. You're still in your holy temple. So I will choose this morning to live by faith. I'll choose to be one of those people that put myself in positions, that come to church each week, that sit before your word each day, put myself in a position to see what you're doing, to hear what you're doing, to write down what you talk to me about, to reflect on that, and to actively wait on you until I see your word come to pass. I want to be that person day in, day out in my waiting we're going to sing a song in a moment that we sung earlier, that song that's really powerful, isn't it? Even though you don't move the mountains, even though you don't part the seas, I want to walk through, I will still trust in you. But I wonder this morning whether there's some of you who would say, yeah, I'm waiting on God. God seems unfair in my circumstance. God promised me something a long time ago. He promised that a child would come to faith. He promised that I would meet someone that would change my life. He promised that he would see me out of this financial ruin. He promised that, and I'm yet to see. I wonder this morning that as we sing this song and, and you stand, you can stand claiming this morning that you will continue to trust in him. You will continue to trust that that appointed time has not yet come, but that nothing can thwart God's ways. Nothing can get in the way of God's time. So you don't have to stand this morning if you'd like to sit and reflect. But this morning as we sing this song, if you'd like to stand and claim that for your life personally as we sing, then I invite you to do that. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. Let's pray. God, this morning we acknowledge that you are here, that your Holy Spirit is moving amongst us, that your Holy Spirit is talking to us, speaking to us taking my fumbled words and, and speaking to our hearts to the things that concern us. God, like Habakkuk, I pray that each person here will seek to embrace, to wrestle with you. They won't choose to, to run and, and to hope things get better one day, but they'll choose to stay in your presence, fighting with you for what you've promised for them. God, I pray this morning that you'll speak. That as you speak, we'll be bold enough to write down what you say. And we wait. Help us to know how to serve you best while we wait. Help us to be sure of who you are and to make our decisions to live by faith based on that and not based on whatever happens around us. I pray today. If you'd like to claim that today and you'd like to stand as we sing, I invite you to do that as we sing. I will trust in you.